Let us now take a look at the data link layer, which uh, talks about sending a group of bits from the sender to the receiver. So what we have achieved up till now, sorry, uh, what we have achieved up till now is that from a given sender to a given receiver, we have formulated some methods to transfer bits. And of course, for us, clock recovery, synchronization, the number of transitions, all of these things have been important factors. But these concerns are only limited to the physical layer. In the data link layer, we are more concerned with setting, sending a big block of data from the sender to the receiver. So this big block of data is known as a frame, uh, which is a set of logical bits. So it can have four bits, eight bits, 32, 128. So frames can come in different sizes. So in this layer, we treat it as an atomic unit of data or a data packet, which essentially contains a sequence of bits. So there are two ways to detect frames. The first way is by demarcation, which means that we transmit a sequence of bits and then we pause for some time, again transmit a sequence of bits, then pause for some time and so on. So uh, one advan advantage here is this is simple, but there are two main disadvantages with this scheme. One scheme is that it wastes some amount of bandwidth in a sense in this idle period nothing can be transmitted. That is point number one. And point number two is that uh, we need a method to detect idleness. So if we have ternary signaling, then this approach will work. And in fact, it will work very well because the idle state in ternary signaling is perfect for uh, this idle phase. Otherwise, with binary signaling, this is somewhat difficult. The other simple approach is called bit count, in which in this we count the number of bits. And the moment uh, we, uh, so let's say the frame length is 32 bits. And the moment we have transmitted 32, we declare that the frame has ended. The main problem in this is so assume, so this is like a one continuous transmission. And then we basically count the number of bits and say, okay, this is frame one, this is frame two and so on. Now the problem is that just in case we miss a bit, then all the subsequent frames will be read incorrectly in the sense this boundary would shift over here, this boundary will shift over here. So we will incur massive mistakes while reading the stream of bits. So instead of that, inserting pauses is a better idea, but again, this requires ternary signaling. So what is done is slightly different. What we do is uh, called bit or byte stuffing which means that at the beginning and end of a frame, we add some special symbols, right? In a bit or byte stuffing, right? So which is one sequence over here and one more sequence at the end, such that once the hardware sees that this sequence of bits is coming by, it knows that a frame was ended. And once when it sees these sequence of bits, it knows that the frame is beginning. Of course, it is possible to miss a bit but the sequences have to be designed in such a way that even if you miss a bit, you will still be able to detect that a frame has begun and a frame has ended uh, with a fairly high enough probability. Again, how to do this, this is a subject of advanced study. So there is a full discipline dedicated to uh, exactly this. So this is uh, coding theory and communication theory. So in such classes, people read a lot about uh, reliably finding the beginning and end of frames. So our main aim here is just to give the basic idea. So let's consider an example. Let's consider this sequence 0x, 0x is an hex, dead b. These are all hex char characters. And the b has an extra e here. So this can very well be the starting and ending sequence of a large frame. So a frame has uh, 1024 bits. So this 32-bit sequence can be at its beginning or can be at its beginning and end. So we can then, the hardware has to be designed in such a way that once it finds this sequence, it can infer the beginning or end of a frame and subsequently we'll have the bits of the frame. Now the issue is that this sequence can also be inside the frame, right? Maybe we really want to send this message. So this thing can actually be 
you know within the text of the frame the content of the frame so the standard approach of uh, actually doing this well there are many approaches of doing this one is that we can maybe uh, in addition uh, have uh, some amount of a bit counting mechanism such that it will find that no no this is in the middle of the frame or we can do something else which is done in C++ and Java. For example, if we want to print the character backslash on the screen, what we actually type is printf in C that is two backslashes. So uh, once the library sees two, it actually infers that, okay, you want to print one backslash on the screen. So in this case, if you want to transmit dead B, uh, what we can do is that we can repeat uh, this symbol dead B, you know, this message two times, right? So we can have dead B and dead B. So then the hardware will see that, uh, will see dead B occurring twice. So it will infer this uh, to be that dead B is genuinely a part of the message and it's not really ending the frame. And... Uh, when we are also, you know, getting the contents of the frame, if we have dead B twice, we'll actually, you know, discard one copy and keep one copy. So there are many, many ways. So this particular method is one way. Uh, there can be other ways as well. But it's important to note that whenever we are doing bit or byte stuffing, it's possible that the additional sequences that we add also can show up in the middle of a frame and they might be relevant data. So that's a rare case, but again, it's possible. So to take care of this, some additional information has to be sent to ensure that you know we can differentiate between a sequence meant to begin and end a frame, a special sequence, which is again discarded at a higher layer, or genuine data, which happens to have the same set of bits, which happens to have the same content as these special sequences. Let us now look at methods to uh, increase the reliability of signal transmission. So up till now, we have been looking at missing a bit. So uh, the, if the sender is sending a message to the receiver, we have basically been considering uh, synchronization issues. We have been looking at issues where we don't miss a bit, but <coughs> that's not the most common source of errors. Uh, the most common source of errors is that because of some electromagnetic interference. So it is possible that a phone rings in the background. It's possible we start a microwave oven. So that would induce a change in the electromagnetic field, which would induce a voltage on these copper wires. And the voltage might be strong enough to actually flip the bit from a zero to a one or from a one to a zero. So this can, <coughs> Uh, cause a lot of problems. In addition, you know, there are other sources of errors as well uh, in which bits can be flipped, but that's a subject of advanced study. So the most common source of errors in transmission, you know, when we are transmitting a frame, can be that a bit can flip. So let us look at the simplest possible fault model, which is single error detection, which means that we need to detect <coughs> if there is a error or not. And the maximum that we can detect is a single bit flip. So the way to do it is actually very simple. So if we consider an 8-bit frame, so these can be the data bits. So we have 8 bits over here. We can add an additional bit called the parity bit. The parity bit is an XOR, an exclusive OR of the 8 data bits D1 to D8. And uh, so this is transmitted along with the message. So if you think about it, a frame, instead of being 8 bits, is now 9 bits. So the logic for this is like this. So, so let's consider the fact <coughs> that the parity bit gets flipped. So what we'll do on the side of the receiver is recompute the parity once again. And now if the parity does not match you know, the computed priority does not match the transmitted parity. We can infer that some bit has been flipped. Either it can be in the frame itself or the parity bit. We will not be able to know, but that's okay. So in this case, the receiver can ask the sender 
to actually retransmit the message and maybe during the time of retransmission the original uh, trigger for the electromagnetic potential might have gone away so the bit fill uh, the bit flip uh, might not happen right will most likely not happen so this time there is a higher likelihood of the message being received correctly because many of these signals that induce bit flips are actually very very ephemeral are, are very very short so let's look at the logic of uh, computing a parity bit in this fashion so what we have seen is that if the parity bit gets flipped we'll be able to detect the case because the computed parity will not be same as the transmitted parity let us now consider a case where a data bit gets flipped and let's see what happens so for the sake of simplicity let's assume that a frame contains only two bits right of course the same result holds you know in a general case when a frame uh, contains n bits but two is the math will be simpler so let the bits be x and y so what we have is that the parity bit is x exclusive or y now let's assume that for some reason uh, the first bit of the frame x gets flipped gets complemented right so we will have this expression so the new computed pri uh, parity will be x exclusive or x x complement exclusive or y x complement can further be written as 1 exclusive or of x the reason we can write it is actually very simple so let's consider x let's consider x complement and let's consider 1 exclusive or x so let's create a truth table if x is 0 x complement is 1 1 x or 0 is 1 similarly if x is 1 x complement is 0 1 x or 1 is 0 so we can thus conclude that these two expressions are equivalent if we write it in this manner what we see if we further simplify so x exclusive or y is the parity original uh, parity bit p which we are transmitting so one exclusive or p is again uh, p complement so what we see is that let this be the computed parity bit at the side of the receiver so if one of the bits has flipped uh, the computed parity bit will be equal to uh, the value of the transmitted parity which is p and the, the complement of that the complement of the transmitted parity so in this case uh, you know p is definitely not equal to p complement so we will detect the fact that there is an error so what has our math shown our math has basically shown that if the parity gets bit gets flipped we'll be able to detect that something wrong has happened uh, even though we'll not be able to find out which bit has flipped and we we will be able to find this out basically by uh, recomputing the parity at the receiver side so we'll see that the computed parity and the transmitted parity are different similarly if a bit within the frame gets flipped we can just extend this math for an 8-bit frame uh, with this math which is simple algebraic manipulations of the ZOR function we find that for a single bit flip the parity uh, bit also gets flipped right so the computed parity if let's say I flip this bit the computed parity will also flip so in this case also the computed parity will not match uh, the computed parity will not match the transmitted parity right so uh, as a result you know this is p complement and the transmitted parity is p so they will not match as a result we can infer that a single bit has been flipped so then of course the receiver can ask the sender for a retransmission so mind you you know in this case we'll not be able to find out which bit has flipped but we'll be able to say that uh, at least one bit has flipped now if there are two bit flips then uh, of course we'll not be able to detect this case because you know the parity so if there are two bit flips then the computed parity will actually be p complements complement which is p so you know we'll not be able to detect this case uh, so th that's the reason there's a single error detection but of course there are more advanced schemes 
for the uh, other kinds of fault models. For example, we have schemes with single bit error correction. So what we can do is given the frame, we can add additional information at the end called the error correcting code, you know, which is far more sophisticated than a simple parity bit. So we essentially need to have multiple parity bits to achieve a single bit error correction. So this is taught in classes on data communication and coding theory. So we'll not be discussing this. This is outside our uh, scope. Even though in the book, uh, I do talk about a method for correcting a single bit error. Uh, so this is not all. We have other schemes as well. So the most, one of the most popular schemes for especially ECC. So what is ECC? It's an error correcting code, which is added to the end of every frame. So this is error It's an error correcting code. So we can have one ECC scheme which is called sec dead, which means it's a single error correct, double error detect. What this basically means is that if there are two bit flips, we'll be able to detect this case, but we'll not be able to correct it. But if there is a single bit flip, we'll be able to find out which bit has flipped and we'll be able to correct it. So in this case, we can recover from the error and the receiver does not actually have to ask the sender to retransmit the message. So the sectored code is very common. So, so of course, this is always done with different assumptions about the error. So uh, in some cases, if you'll only have a single bit error, then a sing then you know a single bit error correction code suffices. In some cases, if there's a possibility of two bits getting flipped, then of course using something like sectet is a good idea. In some other cases, what we can have is that we can have a burst of errors. What this basically means is that if you are transmitting a frame, the nature of the offending signal can be such that maybe you know a string of five bits or ten bits, all of them get flipped or get set to all zeros or all ones. So this is called a burst of errors. Very string of you know for one, two, four, five, ten, fifteen, twenty bits, you know, in a sequence, just get uh, you know reset to some values, right? In, in a sequence, essentially get mangled up. So in this case, we use the CRC code, which also adds extra information at the end of a frame. It's called a cyclic redundancy check. So this kind of code is particularly very useful if you if we are looking at a burst of errors. So you will see that a lot of protocols actually use the CRC code between a sender and the receiver. And the fault model here is that assume that there is some amount of strong external electromagnetic interference. We are assuming that it remains strong for, for you know, a fairly large period of time which means that for a fairly large period of time, the bits will get transmitted incorrectly. They can get flipped or maybe all of them will become zeros, all of them will become ones. And uh, so uh, in this case, uh, what will happen uh, is that uh, if we use the CRC code, we'll be able to at least detect a long burst of errors and uh, we'll be then the receiver will al always ask the sender for a retransmission. So recall that, you know, we had discussed single bit error detection in the previous slide. And in this slide, we are talking about three more advanced schemes, which will be taught in you know, other courses. So they are all assuming different fault models. Some assume that, you know, you can have only a very, very few bits, which will be transmitted incorrectly. Some are assuming that a burst of bits will be trans uh, transmitted incorrectly. A set of contiguous bits will be transmitted incorrectly. So depending upon the fault model, a code needs to be designed. So if we need more detection and more recovery, we need to add uh, more information to each frame. And also at the receiver side, we need to do more work. So that trade-off definitely exists. So depending upon the fault model, which means what kind of uh, external stimuli are, are there and what kind of errors we expect when the 
IO system is operational, we choose one of the codes. Uh, clearly, there is a trade-off between power and reliability. If we choose a code like SecDead or CRC, we'll definitely get more reliability. But what we need to critically evaluate is that is such kind of reliability actually required because it does induce a certain performance and power overhead. So uh, after we have discussed secure, reliable transmission, well not secure but reliable transmission between a sender and a receiver, let us now look at another aspect of the data link layer called arbitration. So uh, let us consider a typical bus where you have, you know, multiple transmitters are connected to a single bus. It's called a multi-drop bus. What is a bus? Again, it's a set of copper wires. What we have seen in chapter 11 in the Snoopy protocol. So you have multiple nodes connected to a bus. So since multiple nodes can send, but uh, you know, not all of them can send at the same time. Only one node can send a message at the same time. It's a multi-drop bus, but we require arbitration. What does arbitration mean? Arbitration means that it gives access to one of the senders to the bus, right? And uh, so assume that in the multiple nodes, all the nodes want to send a message. An arbitration mechanism will basically choose one node first, one more node later, one more node later and should uh, possibly be fair also, such that all the nodes at least get a chance uh, to transmit on the bus. And uh, the process of arbitration ensures that some degree of exclusive control is given uh, to each node that is connected to the bus, such that for a certain period of time, it will be able to transmit a message. So it's sort of the same thing like, you know, if, if a teacher is teaching a class, and multiple students want to ask a question. The teacher chooses one student first, one more student later, one more student after that. So this process is called arbitration, right? When there are multiple requesters, first one of them is chosen, then one more, then one more, and so on. So there are two broad methods for doing arbitration between uh, you know different nodes. One is centralized, and other is called a daisy chain. So how again does this fit into our overall uh, data link layer concept? Well, uh, the basic idea is the data link layer assumes that messages can be sent, but of course they need to be, a certain framing has to be done in the sense group of bits have to be, you know, we need to create groups of bits. That is point number one. Point number two is that uh, there might be occasional bit flips. So uh, frames need to be protected. And after that, when we connect a lot of IO nodes, it is possible that multiple nodes might be competing for the same, uh, you know, set of copper wires to transmit a message. So we have to somehow arbitrate between them, have some method of choosing a winner. So centralized arbitration is actually very simple. So in this case, what happens is we are looking at four IO devices. Whenever an IO device wants to access a shared resource like a bus, it sends a request signal to a centralized node called an arbiter. So all the IO devices do that. Uh, every cycle, the IO device takes a look at the requests that it has and uh, whether the resource in question is free or not. Once the resource becomes free, it chooses one of the devices and gives it access to the shared resource. So let's say if device one is chosen, then the arbiter will set the grant signal to one, right? So initially, uh, device one will set request to one. Other devices might also set their request to one. If the arbiter decides, you know, with some combination of heuristics that device one should get the resource, it sets grant to one. Once device one is done, it releases the resource. So it sends this release line, uh, the release wire to one. So in that sense, the arbiter actually gets to know that device one is done and the next requester can be considered. So this approach is simple, is very simple to implement. The only problem with this approach is scalability in the sense if there are, let's say, 16 nodes or 32 nodes, all 32 will have to be connected to the arbiter. That's a lot of number one, that's a lot of wires. 
Uh, number two, the arbiter will get fairly complicated because it needs to consider so many requests at the same time. So this is a good solution for a small system, but not for a large system. So this request grant release cycle is you know, a good idea for if we have two nodes or four nodes or six nodes, uh, but it's possibly not a good idea for larger systems. That's the reason we have a daisy chain arbitration where uh, the devices are connected to each other pretty much like a linked list. So the arbiter is connected to device one, device one to device two, then device two to device n, and so on. So a device that is interested to transmit will assert the bus grant signal. So uh, we'll have a bus grant signal, which is the so same copper wire is connected to all. Say one of them sets it to one, uh, then uh, the arbiter will immediately get the message. Then what the arbiter will do is that it will inject a token. Right, a token can just be a single wire will be set to one, but this is logically it's being represented as a token. And the token will physically pass from device to device, okay, from here to here to here. Fine. And uh, let's say that uh, if it has, if the arbiter has already injected a token, then it will wait for the token to actually come back. So the token will pass from device to device. What the last device will do is that it will set the release signal. So whoever is the last uh, device on the uh, path will set the release signal, which will destroy the token. After that, also the other thing is once a device's request has been serviced, it will at least uh, not assert the bus grant line. Right? It will stop asserting this bus grant line. So uh, that's the way it works. So let me summarize once again. Uh, the I idea is that we have an arbiter and all the devices are connected in a linked list configuration. What we have gained by connecting all the devices in a linked list fashion is like this, that first we have scalability in the sense that all the devices are not connected to a single arbiter. Rather, uh, they are connected uh, to each other and also, you know, we can dynamically add more devices. We can add one more device at the end over here. The second thing is that if any of the devices is interested, it will simply set uh, the value of the bus grant signal. So the arbiter will know that some device is interested. Now, if it does not have a token that is already in the system, it will create a new token and inject it at device one. So uh, one of the implicit assumptions here is that devices have a priority in the sense that device one gets, if device one gets the token, it will be able to access the shared resource. And device one's priority in that sense is more than device two. After device one is done, it will give the token to device two. Device two will now use it. If it needs it, otherwise it will just transmit it till it reaches device n. Once device n is done, uh, it will release the token. One way of doing it is that, of course, device n can send it back to the arbiter, right? A token is basically a simple message, which indicates that it is a token. But the reason that daisy chain buses don't have this connection is basically because we need to have the ability or the capacity to add more devices if we want. All of these devices just need to be connected to this bus release line. And you just set the release line to one, whoever is the device at the end. And the arbiter will get the message that the token is dead. So next time if some other device is interested, device or devices are interested, a new token can be injected. So this does solve our scalability problem, but in a certain sense, uh, it is slow. The reason that I say that it is slow is because assume there are 20 devices and the 10th device wants the access to the resource, the rest don't. So it will set the value of bus grant. In a centralized arbitration scheme, it would have immediately got the permission. In this case, a new token will be created. It will pass through nine devices and then it will reach it. So this is a slower process, but it is slow yet scalable. 
now let's look at what is a transaction oriented pass so it is a request from the sender to the receiver uh, with a certain semantics right semantics means a meaning a higher level meaning so a transaction can be between you know any pair of uh, nodes so basically let's call one a sender and a receiver so it is possible that they have a complicated sequence of messages where the sender sends something the receiver sends something back then sender again sends something so this kind of a transaction so this kind of a message to and fro exchange is called a transaction so a bus that allows both sides right the sender and the receiver to communicate at the same time is of course called a full duplex bus so in that you know having a transaction oriented communication is somewhat easy so we can represent a full duplex bus by you know two arrows so i can uh, send something to the receiver and at exactly the same time the receiver can send something to the sender right so this is called full duplex communication the two way traffic is happening uh, so in this case having a transaction is well i won't say it is easy it depends on the nature of the transaction uh, but definitely you know uh, this can be used for some transaction related traffic in comparison we can have a half duplex bus which is also fine if the nature of our information exchange is such that only one of the sides right sends data at any given point of time so let's have two nodes with well, instead of calling them sender and receiver let's call them nodes s1 and s2 so in a full duplex bus of course s1 and s2 both of them can communicate at the same time but in a half duplex bus uh, what will happen is that either s1 is sending to s2 or s2 is sending to s1 right so both are not active at the same time as i said either s1 is sending to s2 or s2 is sending to s1 so this is called a half duplex bus so uh, the choice is naturally full duplex is more complicated and half duplex is slightly less complicated but of course in half duplex you need to find out who's going to send but this might be determined by a higher level transaction for example if let's say this is cpu and this is memory right so if we consider full duplex communication the cpu can keep on sending data to the memory data means data as well as addresses simultaneously the memory can read information and send it back so this will be full duplex and the transaction is that i send an address the memory reads and sends the data back half duplex is also possible where the cpu sends something to memory right something being an address so the cpu sends an address to memory and then the memory takes its time and the memory then sends the data back to the cpu so this will be a half duplex communication but as i said uh, between two nodes uh they can have different methods styles paradigms semantics of communication but uh we are sort of grouping a set of messages into a transaction for example reading something from memory which actually requires multiple messages we are calling that entire sequence of messages a transaction and of course depending upon the transaction we can choose our bus technology which is either full duplex or half duplex so let us for example consider a dram read transaction so in the process of reading a dram a memory module we basically have the cpu and we have the dram memory so the cpu sends it an address and tries to read some data so it sends it an address and it gets data back and of course we are assuming that this is a synchronous system so there is a clock and both the dram as well as the cpu are synchronized to the clock and the dram itself is a 2d array of memory cells the first so so this is you know one example of a transaction between the cpu and the dram where the bus is used to effect a complicated operation and each transaction contains multiple messages let's see how uh so first thing that the first message that the cpu actually sends is the ras or the row address strobe 
So this is sent to the DRAM to basically enable a given row. Alright? In the 2D array, in the 2D array of DRAM cells. So then al along with that, along with the row address strobe, which asks it to enable a row, the address of the row is simultaneously sent. Right? So these two are being sent by the CPU to the DRAM. Right, the memory controller unit of the CPU to the DRAM asking it to enable a certain row. Once that has been done, we assume it takes some time, you know, several one, two, three clock cycles. Subsequently, we ask the DRAM once again to enable a certain set of columns within that large row because we might only be interested in this data. So this would again uh, be sent by the CPU. So we will uh, assert the column address strobe asking the DRAM module to enable a certain set of columns where the set of columns are again sent by the CPU right to the DRAM. S simultaneously the CPU also sends to the DRAM a command. You know, multiple commands can be sent but one of the commands that is being sent is a read command saying that look with the row and the columns that we have sent why don't you initiate a read. So these two signals are now sent by uh, the DRAM to the CPU. So the DRAM after getting the row, the column and the read signal initiates a read. So of course it takes some time because it's a large array so uh, parts of the line, the bit lines have to be pre-charged and activated. So it asserts the data ready signal to the CPU. Uh, if we, this tells the CPU that look the data is ready, you can pick it off from the bus. right? So the data is ready. And the data is sent in three consecutive cycles. All right, And then the DRAM's operation stops. Mind you, this is a simple transaction but there is a trick. So let me once again go back and look at all the operations in the transaction. So we enable the row, right? We enable the column, initiate a read. The DRAM performs the read and sends the data back. While doing that, it enables the data ready signal telling the CPU that look, data is ready. And it sends the data back to the CPU, right? So all of this is part of one transaction. But here is the trick. When we are reading the data, the CPU simultaneously sends the information for the next transaction okay, to the DRAM. The next transaction will be one more row. So this is sent by again enabling the row address strobe and the ID of the row. And also the column and the read command, right? So one, when we are essentially reading out one row, the CPU sends a request to the DRAM to simultaneously start the process of enabling another row within it such that the next data transfer can begin from that row. And in the interest of performance and time, the row address strobe and the row signal, you're overlapping this part of the new transaction with a part of the previous transaction, right? When the DRAM is sending data to the CPU, such that, you know, the total time that is required for a set of requests gets minimized or we have a high performance implementation. The important point to note is that this communication is from the CPU to DRAM and this communication is from the DRAM to CPU. So this is actually a full duplex bus. Alright, so this is actually a full duplex bus because information is flowing from both sides, from the CPU to DRAM and DRAM to CPU simultaneously. And uh, of course, you know, th this is the nature. Uh, th so as I said, the choice of the bus depends on the type of the transactions that you want to support and the nature of the protocols. In this case, the protocol is such that we are overlapping two transactions. And since we are doing this overlap, it's necessary to use a full duplex bus between the CPU and the DRAM module. So let us now look at a different kind of a bus called a split transaction bus. So what we have seen is the transaction is a sequence of messages. 
typically the messages are between the CPU and a device. So for example, if you know there's a bus kind of setting and let's sort of generalize the problem. So we have one, we have multiple devices connected to a bus. And let's say S1 is a CPU, S2 is a device. So then S1 will request S2 for some data. It will send a request over the bus. And then S2 will do some, will access the physical device, get the data and send it back to S1. During this time, a regular transaction oriented system would actually hold on to the bus, it will lock the bus. So it will not allow, let's say S3 and an S4 to communicate basically because the S1, S2 transaction is going on. It is very well possible that a transaction of this kind might have a long pause in the middle, right? A long time, a long interval of time when actually no communication is happening on the bus. So this will lead to inefficient utilization. So we can have a split transaction bus, which is conceptually simpler, even though, you know, not, may, might not be actually, but we'll discuss this. So it typically consists of a request sub-transaction where S1 sends S2 a request, it releases the bus and a response sub-transaction where S2 sends, it, sends a response back to S1. So during this period, so when S1 basically sends a message to S2, then it releases the bus. So during this period, other messages can be sent between uh, the request and the response, right? Between the request of S1 and the response of S2 other messages can be sent because the bus is released. So S3 can send a message to S4 and S4 can send a message to S3 or S1. Any kind of communication is possible. So the advantage here is that uh, it is true a transaction is a set of messages, but we need not hold on exclusively to shared resources till the transaction ends. What we can do is we can uh, lock shared resources, uh, resources for only as long as they are required. So at the highest level, it looks like this protocol is more flexible, which it definitely is, because we can connect many, many more devices to a bus and performance should not be hampered. Uh, you know, as long as, uh, of course, two pairs don't want to communicate at the same point of time, it definitely increases the bandwidth that is available to us and the traffic that we can send because we are minimizing idling. And conceptually speaking, it is simpler because we basically just send messages, but we also want to ensure that a certain transaction behavior uh, holds, which means that either all the messages in the transaction reach or none of the messages reach. So, well, this can be done at a slightly higher level by uh, basically a specialized module in S1 and S2, ensuring that, you know, it will wait it will it'll wait for all the messages of the transaction to reach S1 and all the messages of a transaction to reach S2. Only then it will initiate further processing. But that again is a concern best handled at the level of S1 and S2. The bus design and the design of, the, of this particular layer becomes somewhat simple because every uh, message is basically an exchange where uh, the shared resource, if there is any, is locked only for the duration of the message transfer. So split transaction bus is typically used, right, uh, in most systems, unless of course there is a reason for having a purely transaction oriented bus where we will actually have long, possibly long idle periods and not allow any other message transfer to happen in between. So as I said, it is simple in one sense and complex in one more. It's simple in the sense that the bus design is simple. However, the nature of message transfers and nature of ensuring uh, that a transaction actually happens, right, which means that all the messages in the transaction are actually sent, that of course uh, will be handled at a different level. So that can be slightly more complicated in this setup. But then nevertheless, this is the more popular and standard implementation. So now we have taken a look at the data link layer. So let's go forward and take a look at the network layer, which is the next part of the IO stack. Uh, the network layer is uh, primarily concerned uh, with routing messages between different IO devices 
and ensuring that messages reach their correct destination. So uh, every device that is there on the motherboard exposes what is called a set of I.O. ports. I.O. Uh, is input-output. So an I.O. port in this case is a software entity in the sense that uh, we have a software interface which looks like this. So we have a set of registers and uh, the set of registers, so, so this is the diagram of the port, right? So the set of registers, some of them are input registers and some of them are output registers. So the registers are the ones in which we write to uh, or read from. If we need to actually uh, talk to the device, so uh, there is uh, what is called a port controller. So the port controller's job is to take data to and from these registers and you know actually do the right data conversion and put them in the right format. And then of course we have a port connector which is a set of copper leads such that an external connector can attach to the port connector over here. So the port in this sense, you can think of it number one as a software entity. And also, you know, it does have a hardware connotation. So each software IO port is a wrapper on the actual hardware IO port. So the port is defined essentially as an interface for connecting to, you know, one or many IO devices. So in this case, every port will definitely have a copper, you know, a metallic connector and some amount of electronics to ensure that the signals can be processed, the physical layers. And so the port controllers over here pretty much uh, looks at the physical layer and the data link layer, right? So it does all the framing and error correction and all of that. So after processing the physical and data link layers, right? it then uh, sends the data to these registers. And in some cases, it takes data from the registers and sends it out via uh, the port connector. So, the, it, uh, so this entire structure is a hardware port because there is some physical amount of hardware here in terms of a connector, a controller, and you know the storage for these registers. And also there is a software notion of a port, which looks at a port from a software's point of view which is only this, which is, you know, a set of registers that you can use to communicate with the external device. So each IO port, uh, so, that, so I'm, you know, talking of a reference IO port architecture, right, one that Intel uses. So each IO port exposes a set of 8 to 32 bit uh, registers to software, right? So the registers internally can either contain 8 bits or 16 bits or 32 bits. So what software does is that it writes to the registers. So in using assembly instructions, we write to the registers. The port controller automatically sends information to the IO device. So the assumption is that the moment we write to the registers, the port controller will take that information, right, will catch that, do the right kind of voltage conversions and send it to the actual device, <coughs> right, you know, via the physical and the data link layers. Similarly, to read data, the processor reads the registers of the port controller. And uh, so basically, they are supposed to have the data that we are getting from the device. So the way that we look at is that we have the CPU over here. Everything is within the motherboard. You have this little hardware port over here. Right, and uh, so then, so the hardware port is a physical device, right, with a controller, with a, with an interface, right, with a connector, a controller, and some amount of electronics. So the hardware port is then connected to the actual device, whatever it may be. So the way that we actually, so the software running on the CPU essentially sees this port as a software port. Software port is basically an abstraction for the hardware port come device. It essentially sees a set of registers with different sizes. If it writes to the registers, automatically a message is sent to the device. If it needs to read something, the device will send data into the registers and via these registers, data will come to the software. So for example, Intel processors define 64K means 64,000 roughly, 8-bit IO ports 
and each port so 64k is two raised to the power this is actually it is 65536 which is 2 raised to the power 16 all right so 2 to the power 10 is 1024 and 2 to the power 6 is 64 so it's roughly uh, this so each port has a 16 bit port number and uh, each port the size is 8 bits or 1 byte right so this is the interface that we have so multiple devices uh, will basically have you know multiple devices will expose their set of registers and each register will be assigned a unique number called a port number so let us look at the IO address space that we have on a typical x86 Intel kind of machine so uh, the IO address space is pretty much the set of all IO ports that are accessible to software right which in a privileged software assembly code or operating system code can access so here also you see the advantage of assembly code that you can access uh, ports which are otherwise not accessible had assembly instructions not been there there would have been no way to uh, access uh, IO ports and other kinds of privileged resources so we should be thankful to the makers of assembly language for giving us this uh, unique facility so x86 processors have two instructions to access IO ports two assembly instructions in and out right so in basically says so in uh, so R1 is the name of a register it can be any x86 register EAX EBX doesn't matter and the IO port number so what we essentially do is that uh, uh, sorry uh, this thing should have been this way so the contents of the IO port right whatever is in the IO port whatever the device is sending that comes into the register the so n means read it into a register and uh, sim similarly we have another instruction called out uh, what out does is uh, that it basically sets the contents of the IO port which means the contents of the device to what is there in the register so in means essentially getting data from the device where this is the device so in basically says get data from the device and out means send data to the device so that is pretty intuitive uh, in the in the sense that you know in is always input of data reading data into the CPU into the software and out is pushing data to the device right which means whatever is there in the register will get written to the corresponding IO port all right so with uh, just these two simple instructions in and out it is possible for the CPU you know the writers of the operating system via the CPU to control almost all the IO devices so this particular approach of addressing all the IO ports in a via a certain port number or a port address is called IO mapped IO so in this case what happens so, so I'll just show you the broad diagram we have the CPU and we have a set of devices right we have a lot of devices that are connected so what we saw in the original diagram if you would recall the CPU is connected to a north bridge chip which is again connected to a south bridge chip and south bridge chip is connected to many many devices each device has a set of registers each of these registers is given an IO port address and so then the CPU basically sends a message with a port address so the south bridge chip knows that which range of addresses are mapped to which device so it sends a message accordingly to the appropriate device so this is exactly what oops sorry this is exactly what uh, is there on the slide that a request a certain IO request can be in or out contains an IO port address the processor sends it to the north bridge chip the north bridge chip forwards the request to the south bridge chip if necessary the south bridge chip further forwards it to the destination and there might be several more hops it doesn't matter but it forwards it to the device because it basically keeps a mapping of which IO port numbers are mapped to which device 
So each chip, basically the North Bridge and South Bridge chips, maintain a small routing table where the table is basically, you know, multiple entries, but each entry is IO port number and the device. This is what is contained in each entry. So you can have in you know, many, many such entries in the routing table inside each chip, but basically given the number, it knows which device to send the request to. Similarly, the response follows the reverse path, but since the, most of the responses are actually directed towards the CPU, it's very easy for all the entities along the way to know where to send the message to. All right, now let's look at a different scheme called memory mapped IO. So what are the problems with IO mapped IO? You know, why do we need a different scheme? The first thing is that the programmer who's writing the software needs to be aware of the addresses of the different IO ports, right? You have to know that what are the addresses. The same device might have different port addresses across different motherboards or, do, you know, so, so basically who assigns the port addresses? So typically when you connect a device to a motherboard, the Southbridge chip does. So we consider this as a Southbridge chip and multiple devices are connected to it. What will happen is, this, uh, and then this device will say that, look, I have 100 ports, so I give me 100 addresses. The Southbridge chip will give, give it 100 addresses. But it is possible that, you know, the same device for different motherboards can actually have different addresses. So in this case, what will happen is that programs which are written for one motherboard, which assume that, let's say, a given, for example, let's say the mouse has uh, IO ports 20, 21, and 22. This might be the case in only one motherboard with this Southbridge chip. It might not be the case in another motherboard where, you know, with a different kind of chip where the addresses might be 50, 51, and 52. So in this case, it'll be hard to transfer a block of data. Sorry, uh, uh, I'm, I'm still at this point, yeah. So, uh, so in this case, if the addresses are different, a program that is written that assumes that uh, the IO ports of the mouse are 20, 21, and 22 will cease to work on a different system. So this is clearly not portable, right? You can't take one program and run it on a different kind of a, on a machine with a different motherboard, different kind of a motherboard, because you know there can be these problems. Moreover, uh, another problem is that to transfer a large block of data, we are essentially sending it byte by byte, right? Uh, so essentially that's also instruction by instruction. So we'll essentially have out and out and out. So sort of in a for loop, we'll just have instructions which will just send one byte after the other. And this is a fairly slow method of dealing with such devices. Right, because essentially one byte we're sending per instruction. So to send a kilobyte, thousand instructions have to be issued and that's going to be slow. That's the reason researchers in both industry and academia have invented memory mapped IO, which solves most of these problems, right? Most of these problems in this case are solved by memory mapped IO. So in this case, what we do is that we define a virtual layer between IO ports and the application. The application here meaning software. So we make a virtual layer such that the software need not be aware of the particular addresses of the IO ports, even though the operating system might be. What the operating system does, it uses the paging mechanism to map IO ports to memory addresses. So essentially it takes a range of IO ports and maps it to a range of memory addresses. So what the CPU does is that it basically writes to these memory addresses. Well, it thinks that it's writing to these memory addresses. In reality, these messages, instead of going to this virtual space, are actually sent to the IO devices. For example, whenever we write to a memory address that is mapped to an IO port, the TLB directs the request to the IO system. Similarly, for reading data, the response comes from the IO system. So uh, let's look at the advantages, but before that, let me just make a quick you know, detour to this slide and let me show you what exactly uh, happens. 
So if we have the CPU over here, consider the fact that addresses from, uh, let's say, you know, if we count from 0, from 4096 to 8191, which is a 4K address right 4 times 1024 so addresses within this range are mapped to let's say a certain IO device so we write a program uh, and so basically you know let's say given in the operating system in its TLB translation look aside buffer for this range of addresses you know for this page we basically maintain that this is actually not in the memory system but this is in the IO system so this page, we have a TLB entry for it. So actually, let me just uh, maybe go out and draw a bigger diagram. Uh, sorry. Uh, let me just draw a bigger diagram to explain this better. So let us consider a scheme. So, so the way that things typically work is that we have a CPU. The CPU sends the request, the virtual address to the TLB, right? So this is the virtual address. Then the physical address goes to the memory system. That's the typical way in which what we have learned in the chapter on memory systems. But in this case, in each TLB entry, we actually add an additional bit. If this bit is zero, we send it to the memory system. Otherwise, if this bit is one, then we basically, well, we can do some conversion. So we convert it to its IO port addresses, right? IO port addresses. And uh, we actually send it to the IO system. So essentially the programmer, the software which is running on top of the CPU, that is simply not aware that it is actually writing or reading, writing to an I.O. device or reading from an I.O. device. It's simply not aware. The only thing that it knows is that it is running on the CPU and it is writing to a piece of memory. This piece of memory, of course, you know, has been declared to be special uh, with the cooperation of the operating system, of course. But the way it's implemented is that in the TLB entry, instead of a virtual to physical mapping, we have a virtual to IO port mapping. And let's say bit zero tells you in the TLB that you go to the memory system. Otherwise, bit one will tell you that you go to the IO system. So each, so basically if the software writes to a given memory region and that region is mapped to IO ports, so then the request, uh, let me change the, color maybe if that's doable oh can't yeah i yeah i just don't seem to be finding the color well okay so then the request will basically go to the io system do its job and similarly if i want to read the process is the same a, a request first goes to the io system and then it follows a reverse path and comes back to the cpu so the advantage here is that, you know, in my program, I'll only have load and store instructions. They will either be to normal memory or they will be to IO. So what needs to be done before this work is that a given page, right, has to be sort of earmarked for this purpose. We need, the program needs to tell the operating system that I have this page and can you link this page with a certain device? Let's say that device is, uh, uh, you know, a USB controlled uh, joystick or let's say, you know, that l let's keep it simple. Let's say the device is a keyboard. All right. So can you link this particular memory page to the keyboard? So this request is sent from the software to the OS or from one OS module to another. So the OS will then uh, query the North Bridge and the South Bridge controllers, find the port addresses of the keyboard and create a mapping within the TLB, which will basically tell it, so if this is the TLB, the mapping will basically tell it that for this set of virtual addresses, map them to the IO subsystem with these port numbers, such that it finally goes to the port of the keyboard, which is again connected to the physical keyboard. 
so we can use this to send a message you know send me the next key or what is the status of caps lock and also the keyboard can use the same path to actually uh, write the values of the keys pressed in its registers and also to send interrupts and once we get an interrupt the CPU can send a message to the keyboard and read the value of the key that was pressed so this approach is basically an additional layer uh, if you think about it uh, the advantage is that the mapping that is created between the IO ports and the memory addresses functions as a very very effective additional layer the same program can run on can in principle run on multiple machines reading and writing to IO devices is easy you set the mapping first between the IO port numbers and memory addresses and then just use normal load store instructions it is very easy to write read and write a large block of data using block load store operations as we have seen in the chapter on x86 right so basically we can either do a loop or x86 has other instructions to transfer a large block of data from one memory address to other so in this case we can do the same but you know unbeknownst to these instructions at least it'll uh, the data will actually be flowing between memory and IO devices so that was uh, all about the network layer so what is it that we learnt well we learnt about mainly two technologies one is IO mapped IO and the other is memory mapped IO so in one case we actually physically use the values of the IO ports to send messages to IO ports right that is uh, one case and uh, the other cases where we use memory mapped IO to send messages uh, to devices but in this case the software does not use the inner out in and out instructions rather the software uses so the software which can be some other software standalone model of the OS doesn't matter so in this case it uses normal load and store instructions which get, which get in a sense transformed into IO instructions which are then sent to the IO device so this is in a sense nice portable code which is easy to write and uh, which you know can migrate across machines so all of those inherent advantages are there now let's look at the last layer of the IO stack which is the protocol layer which is also the highest layer so of course this layer assumes that the, the existence of the bottom three layers in a sense it assumes that messages can be sent from any node to any other node seamlessly the messages will be correct they'll be reliable and they will always reach the right destination so let us now consider the protocol layer it defines the interaction between the host processor the CPU and IO devices of course at the highest level right uh, so th it basically these are very very high level commands that are sent on top of the three layers and the three protocol methods that we have in the protocol layer are polling uh, polling interrupts and a mechanism per DMA or direct memory access so polling is like this that let's assume that the application running on the processor wants to print a page right it's not a memory page in virtual memory it's a it's a physical page that we want to print so it needs to first find if the printer is free that's point number one before sending it the contents of the page so it will keep querying the printer for its status if the status of the printer is busy the program waits for some time and queries again so you keep on asking the printer are you free are you free are you free this method is known as polling and once uh, the printer says so again how do you ask of course you use a network layer write something to the uh, registers of the printer write the port that is connecting to the printer uh, the message goes to the printer the printer says yes I am free again that is read via registers so the CPU you know via the three layers essentially via the da physical data link and network layers so this method of continuously asking is known as polling and once the printer says that it is free we can then uh, send data which is send the contents of the page and will get printed 
So this method is of course simple, but it's not efficient. There's a lot of extra traffic. A lot of power is spent in sending the messages. And of course, you know, when we are polling for the status of the printer, we're not doing anything else. So we're also wasting computational time. In comparison, we can always use the interrupt based approach. In this approach, the host CPU tells the device to notify it, to let it know if there is a change in its status. So in this case, if the printer is busy, then the host lets the printer know that it is interested in printing one more page and then it doesn't do anything. Then it just remains quiet. The printer sends it an, in sends it an interrupt once, it's, once it is free. So basically once the printer is done with whatever it was doing, it sends an interrupt back to the host CPU and uh, so again, you know, this happens via the IO messaging path, but instead of being delivered as a normal message, it is delivered as an interrupt. So then the host processes the interrupt and the application subsequently, uh, you know, invokes the operating system via all that we learned in chapter nine about processing an interrupt, you know, via exactly that process. And you send a print job to the IO device, which in this case is a printer. Now let's look at direct memory access or DMA, which is different. So polling is very simple. It's basically that, you know, if I've taken money from somebody, then I ask that, keep on asking that person, you know, every alternate day, you know, when are you going to return, return the money, return the money, return the money. This is polling. Interrupt would be when I uh, tell that person that when you have the money, you give me a phone call. Right, so I just need to send one message to the other person that when he has the money, then he gives me a phone call and transfers the money to me. So DMA is slightly different, right? In DMA, the idea is that let's us, let me assume that I've given him a lot of money. So isn't it so well to transfer the money to me? What does it mean if he transfers the money to me by cash? Then I'll have to count the cash and it's going to be a lot of additional work. Instead, he can transfer it from his bank account to my bank account. So DMA is something very, very similar. So what DMA is to us is something like this. Uh, so let us assume that the application is aware that the printer is free because it read the status of the printer and it says that uh, the printer is free. Now also let's assume that it needs to transfer several, sorry, there should space here, megabytes of data to the printer for printing, right? So if it transfers the data byte by byte, right? So if the, the processor will be tied up for the entire duration, right? So for the entire duration that the transfer is actually happening, it is possible that the processor might be tied up and uh, you know, it's a very inefficient process. If several megabytes of data, you know, if a picture has to be printed and it's two megabytes, two million bytes, and essentially we transfer it byte by byte using instructions or, you know, four bytes by four bytes, the process is very, very inefficient. It'll tie up the CPU and the CPU could do something better. Even if we do memory mapped IO, the entire operation will still require a large amount of time. It's like, you know, my friend returning money to me in small bills so I'll have to count the entire thing and my friend also has to count the entire thing. It's much better if he does a bank transfer. That's exactly DMA. It's an outsourcing of this job to the bank, of course, in this case to the DMA engine. So uh, the idea of DMA is like this, that we assign the work of transferring data between, you know, it's typically main memory because main memory contains the data, right? That's where the CPU would anyway get the data from main memory or the caches, but of course that's a secondary issue. And the, so transfer between the you know, physical memory system, which is the main memory come caches and the IO devices, right? So the process of transferring data between the main memory and IO devices, this process, right, the work is given to the DMA engine, which is a special chip that is a part of the Northbridge chip, right? So the part of the Northbridge chip, the DMA engine does its special work. So it has access to main memory as well as to the IO devices. 
So it can seamlessly transfer data between them. So what, for example, the CPU can do is that it can tell the DMA engine that look, can you please transfer one megabyte of data from you know this memory address or main memory to the printer? And then you know once done, just send an interrupt to the CPUs telling the CPU that it's done. So what the DMA would actually do is that it will initiate transfers to the memory unit, read in data at you know 64 bytes at once or 128 bytes at once, and it will send data to the printer at whatever rate it can absorb. So the job of the processor is to essentially program the DMA controller that is part of the overall Northbridge system uh, with the addresses in memory and the size of data we need from memory and transfer it to the I.O. locations. So DMA can work both. So if we have memory here and we have a device here, so DMA can do both. It can do bi-directional transfer. In the sense, it can take data from memory, send it to the device, get data from the device and send it to memory. So it can work in both ways. So you can think of it as a bank. Yeah? So in this case, if my friend needs to transfer money to me, in a sense, he need not uh you know count bills and send the bills uh individually right he just tells the bank that transfer this much of money to me and well the bank does something but i need not be concerned so the same idea the processor tells so the cpu in this case tells the dma engine which, sorry the dma engine what to do and the DMA engine initiates the transfer between the memory and the device. So this is much faster because you know CPU uh, is not involved at all, and uh, also you know the uh, DMA to memory bus is pretty wide. So uh, eight bytes or sixteen bytes at a time can be transferred. So so the, and also the CPU is free to do other things. So there are two main modes of DMA. Uh, so this is very common. It's called a mode of a DMA. So it's called a burst mode and a cycle stealing mode. So recall that our typical system that we have been looking at is we have a CPU, then we have a Northbridge chip. Well, you know, all architectures need not have this. It's possible in modern architectures where uh, some parts of the Northbridge have actually come inside the CPU. But let's just use this as a reference. So Northbridge connects to Southbridge, which again you know, connects to devices. So it is possible that when the transfer is going on, let's say between the memory and the devices, this uh, entire path is blocked. In a sense, it is blocked like a, it's a transaction-oriented bus. So basically, the CPU will also will not be able to send any message to some other device, which is over here during the DMA transaction, uh, basically because this path is blocked. You know, in some cases, uh, we will block any output from the CPU because the Northbridge chip is busy. So this is the fr also called the front side bus, the connection between the CPU and the Northbridge chip. So depending upon the particular implementation, different parts of the motherboard can get blocked but pretty much the idea is till the DMA transaction completes no transactions this is called burst mode uh, the other approach is called cycle stealing mode where we operate in a split transaction mode so we transfer data in smaller chunks so well the DMA reads some data and then it arbitrates for the bus and then transfers data so depending upon the nature of traffic, this can be a good idea or can be a bad idea, but it's more flexible in the sense it allows other traffic to happen sort of concurrently with the DMA transfer. So that is uh, in a sense allowed that you know, other traffic can happen at the same time. But of course, uh, this will uh, require a little bit of uh, additional uh, you know, effort on the side of the designers to ensure that, you know, DMA priority is also maintained and the other device priorities are maintained. So what happens is that in most motherboards, DMA traffic typically has a slightly lower priority 
than other regular traffic because you know it's a lot of data and other kind of traffic especially you know uh, very very interactive traffic with graphics devices with the keyboard and mouse and uh, well the keyboard and mouse will can tolerate some amount of delay but you know graphics and sound devices will not be able to tolerate delay otherwise the video and the sound will somewhat look jittery so they will typically be given higher priorities than dma traffic so so that is up to the particular motherboard to decide what is the best strategy but the main idea is that cycle stealing mode is based on a split transaction kind of idea whereas in the bus mode we pretty much start locking down buses and structures till the dma transaction is over so what we have done till this point is that we have completed all the four layers of the io system the physical data link network and protocol layers we have studied them so we'll move on to study certain case studies so there are five case studies of five different very popular io protocols in the book but we'll not discuss all five here we'll discuss only two two of the major ones pci express and usb so uh, we'll only discuss them and that also in fairly cursory detail before we move to storage media